Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of the CD Sport Podcast with me, Kerry Davis. Joining us today is professional surfer, motivational speaker, mental health consultant, and shark attack survivor, Brett Canellan. How are you doing, Brett? Yeah, really good. Thanks. Good, good to be here. Uh, different time zones, but I got my coffee. I'm, I'm good to go. I know we were, we were talking a bit beforehand. You got your coffee, and I got uh, my beer. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> beverage for all occasions. Yeah, that's it, mate. But uh, no, I appreciate you coming on. I know it's early with you. with this well, 10 past six in the morning, Monday morning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's no, no such thing as too early, I don't think. So it's all good. <laughs> you normally up early anyway? I wake up at like 4.30 pretty much every day. So oh, do you? I've, um, I've been up, yeah, I've been able to do a bit already, which is, which is good. So you're, um, yeah, I think usually at this time, I'd probably be going to have a look at the surf. So um, you you got to get some stuff done before you get sidetracked with that. Could could go for a few hours. So I was going to say more like more surfers. They're up they're up early looking for the the surge in the wave, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. So usually, yeah, up. Well, I don't know. Everyone's a little bit different. I think probably I'm going to say forty percent of surfers are like early surfers and will surf at you know first light until I don't know. They they got to go to work. So usually like seven a.m. 7 30 and then the rest of them will, will go out after that so it's good you get a bit of a changeover but yeah everyone's different it's always good to get in early and kind of get some stuff done before the day starts though yeah right yeah and i bet you feel like uh quite refreshed after the tool coming out of the water then attacking the day as well you know yeah yeah that's it and that's kind of why i like to get up even even earlier is to get that even a little bit more of a head start <laughs> it's, it's a weird thing it feels like you're, you're getting ahead of everyone else who's is already sleeping that's it. That's awesome. How, how's the weather in uh? How's the weather in New South Wales now? You going into winter? Uh, it's start, yeah, in autumn now. It's starting to to cool down. Um, like this morning was was pretty cold. Uh, I, my my girlfriend was sleeping in this morning, so I came down into the garage to to do the the podcast. So it's a bit colder down here than it is in the house, but uh, super nice days. Like this is the best time of year as far as weather goes because real like it's crisp in the mornings but it's usually pretty sunny and, and it'll warm up a little bit throughout the day but the water's still warm for surfing so it's not it's not over the top just yet which is which is nice yeah that's it that's brilliant but uh yeah as i said at the start i think the the one that's going to grab people's attention is shark attack survivor <laughs> isn't it so yeah usually <laughs> yeah rewind the clock back uh five years ago ne well nearly mm. well March 30th, 2016. So five years of the anniversary wasn't so long ago, really, was it? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I, I, it blows my mind how quick time goes. Like that five years for me feels like it's been about 18 months. Um, I know every single year, like on the, the anniversary, I suppose you'd call it, or I've heard it called, you know, biodiversary or shark anniversary. There's a number of different names for it, but um, <laughs> around the same time, sort of each year, I do like a, a bit of a reflection on the year that's just been and hitting five years, is a, a pretty big milestone. Um, like as far as, you know, what I'm doing now in comparison to what I was doing before, just in life, but then also the, uh, the progress or the changes that I've made physically since the attack to to get to you know doing what I'm doing today is is something that I, I usually reflect on as well. And I think it's um it's definitely a, a pretty you know poignant time for me to be able to to do that. Um, but usually that that day is pretty filled with gratitude to you know still be alive and and still be able to yeah do all the stuff that I'm doing today. Oh, definitely, yeah. Just, just like having an experience like that, and you hear a lot of people, you know, when they have like. Uh, incidences in their life not not everybody gets attacked by a shark i know but if they're in a a, fit, a car crash or something i don't know something along them lines it's it kind of rewires their brain doesn't it to be like bloody hell we, we got to start living a bit you know what i mean you just don't know what's around the yeah. corner type thing a hundred percent definitely and and i think that's like the the biggest thing with with my story like the i mean i always mention the odds of being attacked by a shark it's it's one in 3.6 million so it's like winning the yeah it's like winning the lottery in in the wrong direction but i think because of that you you do appreciate and recognize that not many people have that experience and you like it'd be a waste to not take the learnings out of that like and i think for for me and what i'm doing now like i, I appreciate that for myself but then i'll also realize that 
you know, everyone else doesn't have to almost die to you know, learn some of the things that I did. I think yeah. some of the things that I learned along the way are things that a lot of people can start using in their life and, and things that, you know, it, it does create a lot of perspective. Like it doesn't matter what the incident is. Like you said, it doesn't have to be a shark attack, no. um, so to speak, but you know, so many people will go through these life changing things at some point in life. Um, and you do, you do learn a lot from it. And I think that's kind of the mindset that you have to go into it with is knowing that you are going to learn, whether it be, you know, a, a shitty situation or, or something like, you know, it couldn't be as bad or a lot of people take that view of, you know, things could be worse, but, um, depending on the situation, you can always take something from it. And, um, that's kind of what I'm trying to do now is to give the things that I learned to, to other people. Yeah. hundred percent. No, I agree hundred percent to that, Brett, but say you were 22 years old when it happened so you you were a young old lad too weren't you yeah yeah definitely i think um for for me like yeah 22 years old kind of had just started you know not only um trying to you know chase that that surfing dream but also my career within the surf industry was just starting to kick off like managing a surf shop and, and doing things like that i had everything laid out in front of me at that time so it's a pretty significant time in life to have such a big impact um, sort of happen and, and affect what I thought I was going to be doing over you know, the, the next five years. Like if, if I thought what I'd be doing, you know, today, 28 years old, hmm. I, I wouldn't think I'd be doing, you know, what I'm doing now. I think I'd either be owning my own surf shop, hopefully, you know, still competing or, um, you know, working for a surf company somewhere, but my life's done a, a complete flip on what it's done. But, Experiencing that at a young age is, I think, uh, well, obviously it's, it's good for the recovery that kept getting told that a million times when I was in hospital it gives you the best chance of recovery when you're young and fit. Um, you know, which I don't know if that's something you want to hear at the time, but yeah. it, it is true. Like as far as the recovery goes, but also for being able to kind of recalibrate everything and you've realizing that you've got time to, to work it all out. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. Uh, it was, you know, I think a good thing to have. Uh, that time on my side and having it happen at a young age yeah 100% because you you could have happened like you said later in life and maybe you could have been in that mindset still you know where yeah yeah definitely well I mean a significant thing that happened with like throughout my journey in hospital like I was in hospital for five weeks which for me was a really long period of time like I know a lot of people can spend a lot longer in time but I learned a lot just from being in hospital and one of the things that I really recognized is the type of people that I was actually spending time with, like on the ward were a lot of them with kind of like stroke patients and that made them for the most part, a little bit older people. Mm. And the difference in mindset for a lot of them, like if, if you've had a stroke and you, you've lost the ability to walk or speak or whatever it may be, which is, you know, that's life changing in itself. And for, you know, a lot of the older people, I think the mindset they took is like, Oh, well, you know, what sort of, purpose do I have to to try and make a recovery and I'd see them in sort of rehab and they're trying to get back to a point where they can just get home and kind of get on with their lives yeah there was one man that I <clears throat> that I actually uh spent a bit of time with talking in there and and his thing was like he, he'd actually been through a couple of strokes right. and like after he'd been through the the first one he, he kind of rehabilitated and got a, a lot of his his function back and he was like if I was he said, you know, if I was just giving up on, on that, then, you know, I'd just be sitting at home now. And like, it sucks that he had another stroke, but he's like, I was able to get back to a quality of life that you know, a lot of people don't get to have. And I think that was a pretty um, important part in my recovery, realizing that um, it got me to realize that, you know, I, I should definitely be putting a lot of, of time, effort and, and commitment into my own recovery to get back because, you know, if this guy that I'm speaking to that's in his his seventies is working as hard as he can um, yeah. in the rehab ward, then I don't want him showing me up no, first of all. Exactly, but yeah. it's, a young... <laughs> but it, it's a it's a good perspective to have. Hundred percent. I say you young. Like you say you're 22, and mm. well, what happened was, so you you lost three quarters of your thigh. That's what happened, was it? Where the shark? Do, do, do you want to tell the people like, the full story? So. It was on March the 30th, it's about 7 p.m., yep. if I'm right as well, is it? Correct, yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, a lot of people tell you that's not the best time to go surfing, which, you know, 
they're probably right. But you know, when, when you're working and um, yeah, I mean, I had a bad day that day, the shop that I was managing um, surf shop got broken into that morning. So I'd had a bad day and kind of just wanted to, yeah, just wanted to um, try and, you know, wash that off and, and, you know, kind of finish the day on a high, I suppose. And surfing for me was always something I did to be able to do that. So I went, went surfing that afternoon, um, actually called my really good friend, Joel, uh, who I'd lived with before one of my best mates to, to go surfing with me. Um, just told him I was going to go out there. It was a good thing that I did call him um, cause otherwise I would have been surfing by myself, but Joel came down after a little while. Uh, we were both just sharing waves. Like the, I think this is a good thing about surfing for me is that it's not just a sport. It's not just a sport that I'm, you know, happen to be pretty good at. It's something where it is that wider community, mm. like the support within that, that sport itself is, is amazing. But one of the best things is it gives you a chance to make some really good mates. You spend a lot of time waiting for waves. So you get a chance to chat. Yeah, right. And that was one of the best things about that surf is it gave me a chance just to sit out there and chat to Joel about the day that I'd had. And after we'd been surfing together for about 45 minutes, I was feeling a, a bit better. Like the waves were actually really fun that afternoon. <clears throat> um, Joel had caught a wave. Sorry. <clears throat> um, Joel had caught a wave. He was like 150 meters down the beach. And I was just kind of sitting there reflecting on the day I'd had, actually looking back at the sunset. Um, and I got hit from my right side by what felt like, I suppose, a bus. Um, before I could actually figure out what had gone on, like I'd been thrown off my board landed in the water and, and tried to look around to see what had happened. Um, and before I could even get a chance to, you know, swivel my head, I looked down and there's a, a shark bite in my leg, uh, which for me, oh I think a lot of people, they, they try and, you know, picture or think of, yeah, what's going on in your mind at that time. Yeah, yeah. And like, I think, yeah, a lot of people, that's the first thought they have, like, where do you panic? Do you like, what, what are you trying to do? A lot of people like, do you try and punch it? And it's like, to be honest, like in that moment, nothing goes through your mind. Like mm. it's completely blank. Like the, there's no thoughts. You can't think of anything. The thing that happens though, is that your senses are really heightened. So I could remember all the fine details of what happened in that moment. Cause it slowed down. Like time slowed down to the point of stopping um and could you know remember the the feel of the shark skin as i was trying to push it away um obviously punching it makes sense but punching through water is really tough yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um and after after one or two tries of that all i could really do is try and push it away um i could remember the fact that there was no sound at all i don't know that that for me sticks out i don't know why but i think a lot of people think if you're you know part of the food chain um, if you're getting attacked by an animal, you're going to hear some kind of like roaring or, or whatever it is. But mm. I know that I know that I was shouting for help and screaming in that moment, but I couldn't hear it myself. Like it was just deadly silent. Um, even the look in, in the shark's eyes in that moment was something that I'll, I'll never forget. Um, but that moment, you know, for, for me felt like five minutes, like really intimate detailed moment. In reality, it was probably like five seconds. Um, and I made the biggest mistake uh, that I did that day as my, my brain actually kicked into fight, fight or freeze. Um, I suppose I'd already kind of frozen a little bit at the start to take in what had gone on or what's, what had been going on. But the real mistake was going into flight, uh, which makes total sense in that situation. Yeah. But when a shark has a hold of your leg and you pull away from it, it doesn't actually let go of your leg. It holds onto it and kind of separates that, that bit that it was holding from your body. Um, which, you know, in, in the moment, I didn't actually realize that that had happened. Um, but I knew that I was now separated from the shark and I could try and swim in. So I just put my head down, tried to get back to the sand, just focusing on sort of getting back to the beach. And I had, you know, I'd only got 15 meters further in and I had thought kind of come over me, which was, should I wonder if this shark's going to come back a second time? Um, and it was good that I had the thought because I looked over my shoulder and saw it actually coming back. Um, and was able to put my hands out just in time to stop it. My, my right hand landed on its, on its nose. My left hand actually um, went into its mouth and I was able to pull it out just in time um, before it bit down, um, caught it, a few of its teeth on the way through and lost some skin off my hand and have some pretty cool scars up there. But um, <clears throat> from there, it just pushed me through the water for a good you know, 20 meters. Um, the, the power that I had as it was pushing me through the water was you know, something that I've never 
experience before and something that gave me a weird amount of respect for sharks and how good they are at what they do. Um, you know, it sucks to be on the end of this perspective that I had, you know, again, being part of the food chain, but it's something I really appreciate is how good they are at, at you know, finding stuff to, to kill and, and eat, um, yeah. <laughs> which, <clears throat> it, yeah, yeah, strange way to get that perspective. But for me in that moment, as it's pushed me through the water, I'm like, well, what do I do now? Like, I'm so helpless against this thing. It's got so much power. It's got so much strength. And I was lucky that a wave was approaching us. And by the time it hit us, <clears throat> it kind of like mixed us up underwater and, and that's where it separated us. But the good thing was that it pushed me in far enough that when that wave passed over, I could stand up. It was only about waist deep. Um, and, you know, me trying to figure out where I was, what was going on, I look up and see what was probably the best sight I could see in that moment, which was Joel, um, my mate, paddling towards me as, as fast as he could, uh, which I think is an incredible um, thing to do on his part. I know I'd always like to say that if I was in his, his shoes, I'd, I'd do the same thing, but you just don't know until you're faced with with that situation like if he saw the danger and knew what was going on and paddled towards the beach i'd you know you, you can't hold that against him because you know it, that that environment that situation yeah. is you know, something that people don't get faced with yeah. um and it's scary and there's a lot of danger but joel got to me was able to pull me into the beach uh because i'd lost my board in that initial impact um and when he got to the beach uh he he ran off to get some help uh, and it kind of left me there thinking about what had just happened. I made a decision, a, a conscious decision very early on that I didn't want to take a look down at my leg. So I didn't want to you know, go into shock. Um, basically, if you go into shock, you, you lose too much blood, you, you die straight away. Um, and I knew that would be the case. So I decided just to, to you know, keep my mind on not looking down, keep my mind on trying to breathe and things like that. And without knowing how close I actually was, to you know death in that moment the immense blood loss um and and everything that i'd been going through i didn't know that i was actually you know minutes away from from actually dying but i had a thought wash over me which was you know, is this moment what it feels like to, to die like I, I knew that it was significant i knew it was serious but i didn't know i was that close but the strange thing was that I had that thought and immediately the second thought I had was, you know, it doesn't feel right. I don't know what it was about that moment, but it didn't feel like it was my time. And <clears throat> I think it's a, it was a good thing that I had that thought because it allowed me to focus on you know, what I could do in that moment, which was very little. It was basically just breathing and, and staying present. And that's kind of where, that's what I did. And, and that moment's where my luck really started to, to turn. Um, I think the, it's important that, like I mentioned, that I was surfing with my mate Joel. Um, he probably wasn't supposed to be there that afternoon. Um, he's, you know, one of our best mates. I call him for a surf almost every time I go, but he's the type of person that he'll either show up late or not show up at all. So the fact that he was there is is incredibly lucky. Even luckier than that, uh, he'd brought his his wife down uh, to to watch him surf that afternoon, which she only goes and watches him. I don't know, three or four times a year. And she was there that afternoon uh, and she's an intensive care nurse. So that was the help that he ran off to get. They probably both shouldn't have been there on any other day. Uh, and there was, there was one other person walking along the beach so that who you know was helping me through that initial um, first aid. Uh, his name's John and, and he was a nurse as well. So the fact that Joel was there um, the fact that he brought down his intensive care nurse trained wife uh, and there was another nurse there to apply that first aid and, and keep me alive that afternoon was was incredibly lucky. Uh, something that, you know, I, I think about quite often as to, you know, why those people were there. And I don't think there's really an answer as to why they were there, but I'm really lucky and, and really grateful that they all were because without them, you know, I wouldn't be able to be here talking to you right now. Um, so you know thanks to those guys but yeah from 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 that point um they stopped all the bleeding kept me alive until the helicopter got there and then <clears throat> helicopter took me to um hospital up in sydney uh where i woke up to to that news of, of actually what had happened to my leg um so I lost yeah three quarters of my left quad uh in the initial conversations with uh doctors things weren't looking great 
uh, you know, telling me how much of my, my, my quad I'd lost. They were saying we're, we're assessing whether we can do something other than amputate because obviously the extensive damage, um, they were like, if, if any damage has been done, done to the bone, then we, we, need, to op- uh, we need to basically re- remove the leg straight away. Um, they said, but we'll, we'll have a look. We can't really tell at the moment because there's so much sand in there. So they spent a couple of days cleaning it out. Um, and then they <laughs> ended up deciding that they could do uh, an operation, which they'd only ever done once before. So very rare circumstances, um, but they took my left lat muscle from my back uh, and implanted that into my leg. Um, so that the purpose of that was to to cover the bone um, to keep that alive, so it wasn't exposed. Um, they connect a, a blood supply and a nerve, which keep that one alive. Uh, and then they took skin from three different parts of my body and kind of bind it all together in this this webbing. Um, and that's kind of what they did for the. Um, for the operation that that was you know a success as far as everything went pretty well um, but they weren't sure what it was going to be like sort of moving forward there was a lot of monitoring and the I think the things that really started to, to impact me and get me to realize the significance of everything was when they told me you know what to expect long term um, <clears throat> which I didn't really have many expectations for like as far as what they were going to tell me but they told me three things that, that really kind of hit me for six in a way um they told me because of the, the damage to my leg even though they've been able to repair a certain amount they said that i'd probably not be able to walk properly again um, i'd be on crutches i'd you know either if they said best case scenario i'd have like a device on my leg that straightens it out as i move forward um to kind of implement the the quad of that uh, the function of that quad uh, they said because of that living an active lifestyle is going to be really difficult and obviously active lifestyle is, is something that i've always done um, mm-hmm. from you know the young ages when I first got into sport up until you know, at the age of 22. And then the, <clears throat> the third thing that they told me, obviously because of the, the lack of active lifestyle, they said, you'll, you'll never surf again. It was the one thing that they said for certain is that you'll never surf again. You know, they said, probably never walk properly. You know, that's going to make living an active lifestyle difficult. And they said for certain, you'll never surf again, which is, you know, uh, fucking, it's a hard thing to hear, um, you know, for, for anyone. Um, I think, you know, being told that you, you can't do something that you love is is difficult to hear. But for, for me and where I was at that point in my life, you know, training to chase the dreams I've had since I was 11 years old of becoming a professional surfer was, was really hard to hear. Um, and something that, you know, I suppose shaped a bit of my recovery moving forward, um, not only with, I suppose, the... Um, you know, what I needed to do to, to get back to that point, but a big part of of my recovery was being able to notice those things that the doctors had said and, and kind of almost dismiss them in a way um, because I wanted to be able to do those things. I wanted to be able to, to walk again. I wanted to be able to you know, be active and I, I definitely wanted to surf again because that was, that was all I had. It was like my, my purpose, my identity, and I couldn't let it go like that. So I suppose from there, I, I got into the recovery side of things, which was, you know, an extensive process um in itself and and took a lot of time uh, a lot of effort super lucky to have some some good people with me um to to go through that process but uh, i think that itself was probably the the hardest thing a lot of people say you know was the shark attack difficult <clears throat> to go through and yeah. i say no because all i did basically was just lay there um like i, I yeah. couldn't do anything like no. from it, all I could do was, you know, act on instinct, mm. um, which for me was, you know, those last ditch efforts to, um, you know, put my hands out to stop the shark, you know, hitting me the second time. Because by the time I got back to the beach, I couldn't even lift my arms up. Like I couldn't get up the beach because I was so out of energy. Um, so that experience itself was, you know, <laughs> I suppose there wasn't much I could do. It wasn't very difficult. And a big thing that I kind of always say, like when I, I look at my recovery and I'm, I'm going to guess we'll, we'll go into the recovery a little bit um, next. But for me, I realized very early on that I didn't want to be defined by the shark attack. Like, yeah, it's something that happened to me, but in the same way that that guy I met in hospital didn't want to be, you know, defined as being a, a stroke victim and, and the fact that he'd you know, been through that and that's him now like his thing was like, you've always got more that you can work towards. Uh, and that's kind of a big part of me. I realized that you, you 
don't need to be defined by what happens to you. You're really defined by what you do afterwards. Like your yeah. actions speak louder than, than what's happened to you. Yeah. Um, I suppose the, the, the attack itself is, is pretty full on. People usually have some kind of question around that, but um, I'll, I'll see if you, you've got anything that I haven't heard before. <laughs> No, I, th I think you've, uh, I've got some notes down here, but I think you've nailed everything, eh? You must have told that story a thousand times as well, though. So you must have covered it all yeah. already, yet, you know? But, uh, uh, a few times. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like you said, you know, uh, you had to transplant some of your back muscle, is it, to your quad? So that's my quad now, yeah. Um, so I think... The, they said with that operation, they don't usually like to do it um, with surfers or like rock climbers because the, the lat muscle is obviously that, that pulling motion. So for me, it's paddling, but it's, it's the, you know, the, the largest muscle other than the quad mm. that they can use to, to actually do any sort of transplants. So um, other than my dad offering his own quad for me, um, that, was, that was all they could do. So yeah, my, my back is now my leg. <laughs> oh, that's a good gesture by your dad though. Give, you, give his yeah. quad. Yeah, definitely. How how did you like back feel as well though? Surely that must have done, you know, been affected. That well. that was the that was, yeah. Um, to be honest, that was like the one of the more painful parts of the whole process. Because mm. um, having to lay in a hospital bed, um, not only with the the big scar down my back where they had to take it out, but the fact that because your lat muscle kind of cushions your ribs. I was now just laying directly on my ribs. Oh. So there's, that was kind of, it was painful and hard to get used to just because it's never been exposed like that. Yeah. Um, but that kind of, you know, presented a, a new set of challenges as far as, you know, the recovery goes and, and what I could do because, um, you know, learning to walk again, learning to do all those other things is, you know, part of it. But now I've kind of got like two injuries that I'm dealing with rather than just the one because now I've got to learn how to build up the other muscles around that that'll, that'll kind of do the same work. So even to this day, your, your, your back is just like your rib now, is it? Your rib cage? Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. Which is, you know, um, I think the, <clears throat> the, that's one of the things that causes me the most pain i suppose nowadays um not having that support sometimes through my back changes the way i paddle which can hurt my, my lower back a little bit but mm. that's kind of it's it's interesting the way in which your body adapts because there's a bunch of other muscles kind of like up under your arm here um which can do the function just not necessarily as well but they've they've stepped up and, and can you know i can paddle and i can do all those things now yeah and you've just you've just adapted to what you've you've got really i suppose isn't it yeah, definitely. I um, I'll, I know you said during the shark attack you couldn't look at your leg. But when I was reading online, you wouldn't actually look at your leg for the first three weeks. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, so three weeks. I I, I tried to avoid it because I didn't want to. You know, <clears throat> I think I just didn't want to know anything about it at the time. I kind of wanted to to distance myself from that because there wasn't anything I could do about it. Like mm. other than look at it and, and, you know, like the first time I did see it, it was confronting. Yeah. Like the, and I think my thought process was if I'm confronted by it early, then what's that going to do for you know my self-talk? Like how am I going to be looking at things further down the line combined with what the doctors have told me? If I'm looking at that gun, there's no chance that'll, that'll ever work. Cause <clears throat> like I've got photos of it immediately after the operation. And like I was looking at them last night, actually, just um, putting a few things together for, for work. And um, yeah, I look at it now and I'm like, if I was confronted with that at the start, like it would have been real hard for me to, to actually be like, all right, I'm going to get that back to the point where it can work. Like I had to actually process what had happened before I could you know, start looking at anything like that. So yeah, it, it took me you know, three weeks before I could actually work myself up to, to look at it and I think uh, that was a good thing to do because I was ready. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd kind of gotten through that initial, uh, I suppose, emotionally impact of the event, and I was I was ready to start working on my recovery. And that was kind of the point where I was like, All right, "Let's let's see what we're working with." So, and go back to your operation as well. You went into the <clears> hospital. <throat> were you when were you in the operating theatre straight away? Straight away, um, the first 
two operations they did were to kind of see what had happened um, and to just clean sand out. They said that they've never seen anything like it, just the amount of sand that was in there. Yeah, that's insane. <clears throat> and then um, the the third operation, there was kind of like two days in between the first two operations and then two or three in between the second and third. But the third one was actually on my birthday, which is the one where they did the, the big operation with the lap muscle. It was like a, an eight hour operation in total. Um, which is a, a great way to spend your birthday, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it was your birthday, yeah. And you had everyone yeah. on your bed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 23, and having a massive operation like that, it's, it's, it's insane. Yeah. But, yeah, and all my, all my friends saying they were down at the pub celebrating, I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't worry about me. Yeah, so yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get into the recovery, Brett. Like, like you said, um, yeah. Like what? What? Like you know, step by step. What was it? Was it like just stand up first? Is that the first step? Or yeah, I, I think the the recovery started when I was you know still in hospital because they want to see you at least be able to you know go to the bathroom by yourself before you can go. So that was kind of the first bit, um, which is just learning to live with uh, the the injury that you've got, and I think that sets a bit of a tone for. Um, you know, what you've got to look forward to. Um, like I, I hated being in the hospital. I hated doing the rehab there because it was all focused on like, this is what you've got now, learn to live with it. My recovery, I would say, really started when I got out of hospital and went to physio for the first time. Uh, I was lucky the uh, local physio down here, um, Scott Mutton, uh, reached out to me when I was in hospital and he said, mate, I don't know you. Um, I'm, I'm mates with, with Joel, went to school with him, um, you know, heard what happened. I just want to hear you. I just want to help you get better. So come and see me when you get out of there um, and, and we'll see what we can do, which for me, like I, I didn't really know what my rehab was going to look like um, because I was still in a wheelchair for a majority of the time I was in hospital. I thought that I'd be going to like some sort of live in rehab. And I, there was, you know, a lot of time spent looking for what that might be. But when he said that sort of they can do that and talking to the doctors, they're like, yeah, you can do the home and, and go and see that physio. Then, then I was like, okay, cool. That's at least I'll be able to be back in a familiar environment, um, which I think was great. Like not being in hospital, not being away from home. Um, that was a big thing for me. But the first day I, I actually went and met him and had my first physio session with him. One of the first things that he did was he, he wheeled a whiteboard over. Um, he, got, he just said, we're, we're going to set some goals for the next you know, couple of months. And before even asking me what my goals were, he wrote down the top one as surfing. And I was like, man, I don't know, I don't know if you've talked to the doctors or, not, or like read the reports or anything, but you know they said I wouldn't be doing that. So I don't know why you put that up there. But you know, it was the first time I'd met him. I didn't really want to um, have an argument with him. So I let him have that one. Um, and then under that, he, he, he kept going. He just said, like, you, you're going to have to regain your independence. Um, so you got to get back in the car. Uh, and then he said, you, you eventually going to have to, you know, regain your livelihood. So you're going to have to get back to work. Um, and, you know, without, I, I, you know, I definitely agree with those last two, um, as far as like a, a quality of life standpoint goes. And I think I was a little bit conditioned by that rehab in hospital. Um, and I was like, okay, cool. Let's try and get to that point where, you know, I'm, I'm living more of a comfortable life where I do have a bit of independence and you know, I can go back to work and stuff. So it was kind of from that point where we started working towards those goals, like every single day, um, going to physio, um, working on just the little things at the start. Like the, the first couple of weeks, um, he was, you know, we, we couldn't actually do anything with the leg itself. Um, so for me, it was just like reworking up my upper body strength because I'd lost a ton of weight when I was in hospital. Like I think I came out of hospital weighing like 55 kilos or something ridiculous yeah, yeah. So and was, was so, yeah, I was so, so weak. Like all like my arm muscles and that were, were so, like they just atrophied so much to the point where I like, couldn't open yogurt, like the little peel back lids on them. So that was the first couple of weeks was just working on, on how to build up that strength um, until we could start working a little bit more on the leg. Um, and kind of when we got, got that, it was a slow and, and cautious process um, because they didn't want to do any damage to it because it was kind of like if you damage it and we have to reoperate, that'll be really bad news. Um, but we just slowly worked at those couple of things. I think um, having, having Scott set those goals for me was something that 
really helped motivate me over the next couple of months um, because it was one of the first times in my life where I've actually had, you know, goals with, with proper outcomes where I could actually work towards them. Like my goal from, you know, the, a really young age when I was um, starting to surf was always to, you know, make it onto the world tour and become a professional surfer. Yeah. And that one, that's, you know, a great goal to have, but unless you're one of the top 34 people in the world, like you're, you're not going to achieve that. <laughs> and, and like in being realistic with my, my talent and everything, like uh, that would have been hard to do. The reason why I was trying to do it is because I didn't want to look back when I was, you know, 40 years old and think I'd missed out on an opportunity. Like I think I've always had that mindset that I want to make the most of, of what I've got. Um, so having goals where it kind of had, it was a bit more realistic and, and achievable, but it had a bit more of a timeline to it really helped me, but it kind of, it got me like in a pretty, like when I was reflecting on them after that very first session, I was like, shit, at least, you know, I might not hundred percent agree with, you know, the, the top goal of being able to surf again. Like I need the other two for my way of life. And even though I don't believe hundred percent in being able to surf again, like I was pretty grateful just for the opportunity to be able to put that there. So I think having the goals just allowed me to really shift my, my perspective and my mindset on the whole recovery to, you know what, at, at least I, I can work towards it. Like I can, I can put things in place to help me try and achieve it. Um, and in the same way that I was trying to achieve that surfing one when I was younger, it got me to realize that you can be a bit more proactive with, you know, what you can do to achieve goals. So you, like you can set them and work out what you can actually put in place to try and achieve them. Mm. If you do, then that's, that's great. Like you, you feel on top of the world. If not, at least, you know, you've, you've taken things in, in your control and, done as much as you can to try and achieve it and if it doesn't work out then you know it doesn't work out at least you don't look back and say well what if and yeah. i think that's a, a big part of uh, my recovery moving forward like and that's kind of you know a way in which i look at a lot of things in life now is, mm -hmm. is with that same sort of perspective so over you know the, the next couple of months we just work towards those goals when we could start you know moving a little bit more um, on the legs um, to get towards that that first goal of being able to gain my independence, um, get back in the car. All I had to do was just be able to bend my knee enough, um, which was more just a time thing. Um, they just wanted to be real conservative to, to not upset skin graft or, or any of the operation sites. So it took a bit of time um, and that's hard um, when you, you want to you know, keep moving forward with your, your recovery and you might feel pretty good, but the doctors are saying, just be patient. Um, but it took me probably about three months to be able to bend my knee enough where I could get back in the car and, and regain my independence. Um, to get back to work, uh, I needed to be able to stand on my feet all day um, to get back to the, the surf shop, that is. Um, stand on my feet all day, obviously be able to walk around and, and not have any issues there. That probably took me about four months. Um, a few other things that, that really helped that, like obviously when I could get up and, and walk around a little bit, I was just doing it as much as possible yeah, yeah. Um, and just took every opportunity to go for a walk, whether it was like walking the dog or, um, you know, just walking laps around the house. Like one of the best things I think for, for that side of the goals for me was I actually took up golf um, pretty yeah. early on, like in, yeah. in my recovery, because I was, I needed to do something. I couldn't just sit at home and even like in the early early times when I couldn't walk by myself, I could always just get in the golf cart, go and, and hit some shots. Like because of my leg, I couldn't really rotate and everything was just a, a mad slice out to the right. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, by the time I could walk around a little bit more, it, it really helped me be able to you know, just practice that. And because I kind of really fell in love with golf as I was mm. learning it and playing it, um, it was something that I wanted to do. So I was subconsciously working on walking every single day. So after, yeah, that sort of four month mark, it, it got me to the point where I could go back to work. Um, and then I still had that, that, you know, last goal of, of surfing there, which I was, again, when that was the only goal left, I, I kind of needed to go through another bit of a, um, a mindset shift to the point where I needed to put everything I could into trying to achieve that. Um, because that was the only one I had left. I was like, all right, let's, let's really try and, and push and work for this. And I worked as, you know, as hard as I've ever worked anything to try and, you know, get back to the point where I might be able to surf again. But I suppose at that point in my recovery, the, the gains got smaller and smaller, um, because I was getting more strength and putting in the same amount of effort and, you know, not having the same outcomes. It's, uh, it's hard to deal with at times, 
Um, because I think, and this is kind of a thing with just the recovery in general, there's so many ups and downs throughout all of it. It's not like I was able to just you know, bend my knee overnight and get back in the car and then no, be on my no. feet and be able to go back to work. Like there's so many ups and downs. And I'm sure you've heard this with you know, a lot of other sports people that you have talked to is that rehab and recovery, it's not just the injury side of things. You're dealing with so many other you know, mental challenges the whole way through it. A big part of it's because you do feel alone in what you're going through and and it's it's hard to actually work your way back to you know being a part of a team or you know back to the point where you can do what you're, you're actually trying to achieve um but those those ups and downs were probably the the biggest in that that last um little section when i was working towards surfing um and i think scott like my physio he he could see that you could see I was, I was struggling a little bit more um, in those later stages. And um, I think he realized for me that it would be good just to get me in the water, um, whether it be surfing or swimming or whatever. Um, but he, he was like, oh, I'll give you a test. Like I was in physio warming up one day and he was like, jump on the ground and just see if you can stand up. And like I tried the first time, I failed pretty miserably um, just because I hadn't done it. <laughs> and he, he gave me a second chance, um, did a little bit better the second time. And he was like, well, I think, you know, at least you can go out and, and have a paddle on a surfboard. You can you can try and stand up if you want. I don't think you're gonna hurt yourself, but I think it's probably about time you you go and and you know recognize you can get back in the water. And that day for me was like a obviously a, a really big day. Um, but I was pretty scared in in the same brain. Like not only you know scared in a way of going back in the water, but the biggest part for me was being scared of failure. Like even though surfing was something that I'd had written down as that final goal for so long like that was five months up until that point of, of recovery every single day um even though like that was there i hadn't really considered what it would mean for me if i was able to do it again and the biggest thing was i was like what if i'm not the same surfer i was before what if i'm you know what if i can't paddle on a surfboard what if i can't stand up and that's i think that fear of failure was something that when I look back, that was actually, even though I hadn't directly thought about it, that was kind of subconsciously holding me back a long way. Um, and I, I took me a little while, like getting back in the water was, was one of the best things ever. Um, like as far as being able to just go in the ocean. Um, but then it was kind of dealing with that, those, those fears of failure and trying to adapt and adjust to what was going to be my new level of surfing whether it was just something that i was going to do because you know i enjoyed it or if it was something i could do competitively um but i mean getting back in the water was a huge huge day for me um you know the there's a, a photo that um I, I show regularly to people that um is just me and my best mate nick um just standing on a tiny little wave um down at jaroa um, nothing special at all, but definitely you know, the, the best surf I've ever had in my life. Like if, if I looked at that photo before the attack and someone said, this is going to be the best surf of your life, I would never have believed them. Um, and that photo for me, it does, <clears throat> it does represent a lot, like as far as my recovery goes, but it, it really represents the, the shift in perception I had as far as being, um, you know, grateful and, and realizing these opportunities that I did have and, that's a big part in not only making the most of my situation in the moment, but it did a lot for my personal growth, I suppose, as, as I kept moving forward, like being able to realize things in that light. So being, yeah, getting back in the water it took me five months uh, in total, um, almost to the day, um, which I, I think, you know, looking at the hard work that goes into it, I'm, I'm proud of, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, the, the actual work in the gym, the work at, at rehab, all means a lot when you get to actually look at that end point and be like, yeah, that, that actually paid off. And, and I got here like that, that plan I put in place to, to be able to do it, take those things in my control to actually work. Um, <clears throat> Cause you know, as far as like the, the, the plan goes, like you can have a plan um, or like, I'm sure a lot of people have heard about like the, the process um, you can have that and it'll get you a certain amount of the way there, but it, it does take you know, a lot of hard work and a lot of dedication to, to really achieve you know the the big things in life like whether they're big goals like surfing for me or you know people might have big career visions whatever it may be the hard work part to the the process is the most important ingredient yeah 100 percent. yeah, that, yeah. that's such a cool and inspirational story it's uh 
like you say, five months and you're back in the water. You know, it's, yeah, uh, it's yeah. crazy. And I read on a, yeah. I read an article online, one of your articles, and like you said, your first surf was your Fenner surf, you, like you said there, with your friend, is it? Yeah, yeah. So Yeah, definitely. <laughs> ne- never would have thought that. But yeah. yeah, and still to this day, um, like definitely the, the best surf I've ever had. I always think about it. It's, I, don't, I don't have many other surfs that are that memorable, like as far as no matter how good the waves were or, mm. you know, what I did in, in the ocean, like there's, there's not many surfs that are as memorable as that one. As that one, your first day back in. <clears throat> was it, was yeah. it, um, so when you went back, I know you said at the start, it's like 3 million to one to have a shark attack. Yeah. But did you have any sort of like, like thought of the shark when you went in or no? Ah, uh, yeah. Like uh, I'd, I'd be lying if I said I, you know, didn't have any thoughts. Like I even, you know, to this day, I think about sharks every time I go in the water, but not in the same way. I think every surfer thinks about sharks when they enter the water because you, you kind of need to, like you need to accept that you're going into their environment. Yeah. Um, you need to accept that. Yeah. Like a, a big part of being a surfer is that risk. It's, it's the same with, you know, any other sport you might do, any other yeah. activity you might do. Every time you jump behind the wheel of a car, you accept the risks that, you know, there's other people on the road that might not be as good a driver as you. Mm. Um, every time you might, you know, jump on a, a footy field, you got to accept the risks that you could, you know, cop a knock to the head. And, yeah. like, it, it, it's a big part of life, like, the, the risks that we do take. It depends on how you frame it, though, like, I like to frame it as, you know, the odds side of thing, yeah. <clears throat> one in 3.6 million. You know, the, the chances of it happening the first time was you know, unlucky um, for it to happen twice. <laughs> I mean, you, you hate to, to say, you know, yeah. what are the chances of it happening twice? And it does because I've, I've heard of it happening to, to one guy who got bitten twice. Really? But even for, even for him, he, he died in a car crash. Um, so it's the way in which you look at it, like that perspective yeah. you, you you give to it allows you to, um, you know, even though you're thinking about sharks every time you go underwater, it allows you to be okay with it. Fuck, that's mad. So you, you got the ta- <laughs> two shark attacks and he died in a car crash then? Yep. Yeah. That's pretty, uh, <laughs> bloody hell, that's pretty bad. Isn't yeah, that um, is definitely. <laughs> No, like I said, on your recovery, I saw on your Instagram, like you're doing like, I don't know how uh, far into your recovery or how af- late it was afterwards, but you're doing like full on box jumps and everything now, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was, <clears throat> yeah, that I think um, with the, the box jumps and stuff like that, it, that was more just like a bit of fun to do in the gym. Um, like a, a big part of me was, was building up strength more so than anything like when you lose straight quarter to your left quad that's a significant amount of strength that you've le- lost from from you know your, your leg especially as a surfer yeah. um so strength was kind of number one priority but the sport of surfing is pretty unique with the skill set that you need you need to be strong but you also need to be explosive so you know the, the box jumps and stuff like that came in just as a, a bit of fun but they, they do have a functional quality to you know the type of surfing that i always you know enjoyed doing mm. um and I think being able to work on that and work on it all properly is, has probably been a, a good thing for me and my body in general. It's taught me how to, um, you know, strengthen up real important parts of, of my legs and my knees where, you know, earlier in my, my life, my career, I got injured a lot as far as, you know, knee injuries and ankle injuries yeah. and being able to work on it properly and, and actually take smaller steps to it really helped me, you know, to the point now where I, I think I'm, a lot better conditioned for doing that type of stuff and hopefully don't get as hurt as much. Yeah. It's, you're, you're training better now than you were when you were before the attack, like for surfing. Yeah. 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 So that's I, it. And like, I hadn't done a heap of training before. Mm. Um, and I think that was probably another thing. Like I'd only really picked up going to the gym and, and working specifically on, on surfing strength and training probably about three months um, before the attack. So for, you know, a, a large part of my life, I wasn't doing anything. Um, yeah. And to be able to go, you know, to, to doing things the right way made a huge difference. Awesome. And as, as for your surfing now, yeah. is it like, it was, are you as good as you were or how are you, how are you looking now? I've seen some photos on um, Instagram and it's, uh, the waves are pretty good. Yeah, um, I think it's a hard question to answer because yeah. I think a lot of people, they like to, like a percentage of you know what i was yeah 
yeah be like oh you know i'm 80 percent or 90 percent of, of what i used to surf but it's it's hard to gauge because it's just different like the the way in which i surf now is a lot different to how i did before um like uh, for example like uh, if you look further back in my instagram i was more about doing sort of more progressive surfing like aerials and um you know more of that type of surfing which is heaps of fun that's probably why i got injured more doing more of that type of surfing um it's higher impact and a lot yeah. more difficult and te- technically is very tough um but now because i did focus so heavily just on the fundamentals of surfing because i kind of needed to i think now i surf in you know a competition sense probably better like i can surf um traditionally a lot better now than i did before because i'm not as focused on just doing airs um which you know has helped because you know since that i suppose that time like setting my goals moving forward it wasn't so much about um you know putting together a a really cool edit which i was always focused on before is you know making um you know edits that people like to see to it shifted more to the competitive side of things where i was like i think i could take a more of a pragmatic approach to surfing a comp and probably have a better chance of winning and to be honest like the results that i've had in comps since have almost been better than than what i had before um so i suppose to to answer your question it's it's not so much um what am i as far as a percentage it's it's just different like i'd say um a better surfer now than i was before um in in more of a traditional sense but that's just because i focus on different things awesome brilliant like yeah. I said, really, yeah, it's uh, inspirational how you what you've done, you know, in those five years or and the, the progression you've done to where you are now. It's awesome. And, you know, have you got any big plans in the next 12 months or so? What's your plans now? Just keep doing what you do. Uh, yeah, no, pretty, pretty big plans. Um, I'm actually working at the moment on uh, filming a documentary um, of kind of my whole story and awesome. um not only i suppose the the initial impacts because there's there's parts of my story which you know aren't mine to tell like i mentioned joel and aggie um who who were there on the beach to save me like their perspective on the story is is you know a a powerful thing in itself um same as you know what my parents went through and i think there's so many parts of my story which when you hear it all together um it, it is so much more powerful than you know what i was going through because my story by itself when i tell it like i, I just did it is a, a pretty i suppose I, I look at it in a very selfish sort of way like the attack was about me the recovery was about me um there's so many things that you know i needed to have that mindset to do it but there's so many other parts of the story that can make it a lot more powerful so um we're working on sort of filming that at the moment um i mean a a big part of of what i do now is like i I constantly find myself asking you know what's next like when i finished surfing or like got in the water after five months i was like okay well now what do i do because i've got to you know set new goals and keep working towards new things um and that's a a big part of of the documentary as well because It's funny, like anyone I talk to who's had a, a pretty serious injury or, or you know, a significant illness in their life, always want to manifest overcoming that in some kind of physical activity. Um, and like I was, I was talking to a guy the other um, the other week who's had um, cystic fibrosis and his big thing when he kind of overcame the um, severe impacts of that, he was like, I want to run a marathon. And he did that and it was that motivated me a lot because you know for for me i was once i could walk once i could run once i could do all these things i was like okay cool now what and um ended up doing like a 100 kilometer walk um Mm. about two years ago um which for for me i did it for a couple of reasons number one to see if my body could do it but number two to see if i could kind of get to a point where i i wanted to give up and see if i could push through it um which that walk for me is something that, again I'm, I'm really proud of being able to do um you know i the last 35 k's or so um my my knee kind of blew out so the last 35 k's were, were agony for me and being able to walk through that and finish it was a big thing where i was like okay if i can do that well now what can i do hmm. so part of the documentary is going to be about sort of yeah what, what do i do now um, one of the things i'm looking to do is the um the Molokai, which is an ocean paddle between um, Molokai and Oahu in Hawaii, oh, wow. um, which is a, a 52k paddle. So, 
um, we're we're hoping to to have that as as part of it because I think the my my story is kind of split into to three parts. It's like the um, the initial you know the the attack itself, and then the recovery from that to the point of being able to get to the point of that now and then it's like okay well, well now what and i think there's a lot of a lot of things that, that people can can take from that because you know a, a lot of people you like we said at the start you, you don't have to go through a shark attack to realize this but we're all pretty lucky to be in the the position that we we are in um like everyone has opportunity um whether it's opportunity to to chase their you know their, their wildest dream or if it's the, the opportunity to just make a better life for themselves asking yourself what's next is such a powerful thing because it allows you to you know put things in place you can it, like i said at the very start if we can identify what our opportunities are and, and we can be grateful for that and it's like all right well what can i do to make sure that i leave no stone unturned and, and try and achieve that if not again like it's it's one of those things where you know at least you've given yourself every chance to to be able to to make that succeed so that that's going to be a pretty big theme of that that documentary um which i'm i'm really looking forward to i'm actually working on it today i'm gonna to go uh swimming with some gray nurse sharks um which i'm i'm pretty excited to be able to do are they, plac are they placid or aggressive uh they're they're more placid yeah okay. definitely um yeah I, I wouldn't say aggressive but yeah who knows <laughs> why would you go to do that uh there's actually a um a place really close to here uh that's actually a, a breeding ground for them so there's there's oh, a lot of them it's only about 20 minutes away from from where i live which is lucky really? yeah so i'm i'm really looking forward to that i mean i've been kind of pumping myself up for a few few months to do this one so <laughs> I'm, I'm keen <laughs> are you nervous or you're right <clears throat> um i'm nervous but at the same time like i think there's something i'm i'm real excited to be able to see how i react in that situation um, not only for my, myself, but to, to kind of see what that means for a lot of other things that I'm you know, afraid of, because mm -hmm. I think it's a, a good test of, of how you can deal with that. Definitely. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Back, back to the documentary, when do you think it'll be out roughly? I could share it on my page. Um, I'm going to say we're, we're hoping to finish it by the end of this year, oh, um, awesome. but it does it does depend on when we can do that paddle. So they've, mm. they've had to cancel the paddle for this year. So we might right. push it back or a lot of it depends on, on travel. Um, filming a documentary through COVID is probably not the, yeah. the easiest thing to do, but we'll, we'll make it work. Just another challenge. That's it. There's another challenge for you. You're gonna, is it going to be on channel yeah. 10 or channel seven, channel nine, something like that? Um, trying mm. to figure out um, where, where that'll end up. Um, Obviously, we're we're trying to look for someone that, that might pick it up mm. on you know some kind of um, wider platform because I think there's uh, I mean, the, the thing about being being bitten by a shark there's there's always people that want to hear the story um, and I think people hearing the story is great but also I think what comes from it's going to be even even more important to a lot of people so aiming aiming pretty high we're, we're, we're hoping to get it on you know a, a netflix or, or or an espn or something like that so um really really looking forward to, to kind of seeing what happens there and then kind of you know what what we can do on on the back side of that as well as far as um you know my, my own career in in speaking and and all of that goes so definitely um exciting like you said if, if i got anything planned for the next 12 months the answer is yeah a fair bit yeah you've got a lot going on yeah, yeah. I, I love a, I love a word with the BBC over here. Yeah, there you go. That'd be you heard of the B, You know the BBC. You know the BBC. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. That's like yeah. our main one in uh, the UK. So it's yeah. a pretty big platform over here. But uh, no, that's awesome, yeah. uh, Brett. I say we are coming up to an hour now, so it's flown. Yeah, oh, it does. It always does. <laughs> always does. Honestly, I put a stopwatch because sometimes the time just goes. I'm like, because some people have to go certain places all the time. Yeah, I, I yeah. could talk for two hours for it, you know. I enjoy you <laughs> stories and stuff, but um, that's awesome. Like, yeah. before I let you go, though, <laughs> any shout outs where we can find you on social media, anything like that, so people can follow you? Um, yeah, you can follow me on uh, on Instagram. I'm just Brett Canellan, uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find, like you said, Canellan's pretty unique name, so um that's easy uh the the documentary is called pyrophytic um you can follow that on on instagram as well um or there's a bunch of links in, in online through it so um yeah keep an eye out for that hopefully uh be able to um drop that one 
end of this year, start of next year. And um, yeah, really looking forward to it. Uh, you know, telling that story in a bit more of a broader sense so a lot of people can hear it. Top top man. I'll um, se- send me some photos and the link to your video and maybe I can yeah. give it a, get a bit of a media over here then for you in the UK. And awesome, stuff. yeah. So, That'd be good. I'd, I'd love to be able to get back over there. Um, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't been to, to Wales itself, but I've spent a lot of time in the UK and, and love it over there. Yeah. I, as, like I was telling you before, I used to live in Australia and a lot of... Um, I meet a lot of people and they'd all say the same. I've been to England, I've been to Scotland, been to Ireland. Yeah. Oh, I, did, I didn't go to Wales though. They never go to Wales. I know, <laughs> I know, that's it. My, my sister actually um, was there surfing or she was doing a oh. surf coaching course um, and she she said it was it was lovely and she was like, the, the people there are amazing. And yeah. um, I, I think not not just trying to, uh, you know, pump your own tires up, but uh, <laughs> I think most of the, the Welsh people that I have, I have met are, are awesome and, um, as far as the accent goes, I think we went pretty well today. Um, yeah. I reckon the, the Welsh accent is the best of all the UK accents because it sounds the happiest. <laughs> Appreciate that, Brett. Thank you. Top man, Brett. Yeah. <laughs> Brett Canellan, everybody. Awesome. No, thanks. Thanks heaps for having me on. Appreciate Thank you. it. Eww.